please be seated. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence, and we pray that we would sense your presence this morning. We pray that you would comfort our hearts. Uh, we thank you that you inhabit the praise of your people and that you desire for us to seek you out and to seek your face. And we come boldly before your throne of grace today. Even though we cannot see you, we know that you're God. We know that you're everywhere present. And we uh, count this time uh, very, very precious and special. And we know that you do, too, because you love to hear from us. Uh, you love to share in this time with us. And we pray that we would sense your presence today, uh, that it would be a great, great comfort to our hearts, a great joy to our hearts, and great peace to our hearts, and that you would renew the hope that you've shed abroad in our hearts. And whatever... Uh, circumstances, um, uh, situations, events that we've brought in here this morning that have weighed down our hearts. Uh, we pray that you would make them light, you would lift them. Uh, as you remove our sin as far as the east is from the west, we pray that you would remove them uh, that far from our hearts and our minds this morning, that we wouldn't be weighed down or burdened, that we wouldn't have a care uh, in the world this hour, that we would uh, just desire uh, to meet you, Lord, during this time of worship. And it's our prayer that everything that would be done in this service would be to the glory and the honor of our Savior. Uh, Father, we, um, so I lift up each heart that's here and pray that um, you would do exceedingly abundantly above all uh, that they could ask or think that you would show your hand of love and mercy and goodness and grace. And as uh, we seek to remain pure in heart, we know that we will see God move in these ways. Uh, also, Lord, too, uh, we think of our, uh, those of our congregation that can't be here today. Uh, we lift them up. Uh, we know that they're here in spirit, Lord. Uh, if they're ailing physically, we pray that you would touch them. Uh, we pray that you would bring great encouragement uh, to their hearts. Uh, we especially think, Father, of uh, Patricia Fogal. I think of Fred Legler. Um, we lift up Sandy Sherman, uh, still in the uh, Somerset nursing home. Uh, bless her heart and encourage her and give her great strength to get home. Uh, Father, I think of uh, the others that didn't venture out today because of unsteadiness or sickness or the weather, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, we pray uh, that you would minister to their hearts, that you would encourage them, and that you would fill them with great joy, great peace, and great strength. Uh, Father, also we think of our country uh, during this time. Uh, we uh, think of uh, the transition that will come with, probably come with government, and we ask that your hand would be upon our leaders in every which way. Uh, Father, that uh, they would pause to uh, consider the God of the Bible uh, and uh, keep them, and also, Lord, keep us from uh, making you into our own image. May, may they... Uh, seek the God of the Bible for their decision-making, uh, for their wisdom, uh, for discernment. Uh, may they bow their hearts and their knee. Uh, that's our prayer. That's our prayer, O oh God. And we also pray uh, for a great revival across this land. Lord, uh, revival starts with you. 
And we pray that you would send a great revival, uh, that the churches that preach the gospel uh, would be on fire and would stand for truth uh, and would shine brightly in, in their communities. And uh, we thank you. Uh, we thank you uh, for uh, being the church uh, that we can shine brightly in our communities. Uh, we lift up all these prayers in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Okay, so Bob and Jerry are going to minister to us in special music. This morning's first scripture reading from the Old Testament, from the prophet Isaiah, the 52nd chapter of the book of Isaiah can be found on page 716 if you're using a red church <coughs> Bible. Again, the 52nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah writes, Awake, awake Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city, 
the uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, rise up, sit in throne, Jerusalem, free yourself from the chains on your neck. Daughter Zion, now a captive. For this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and without money you will be redeemed. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. And now, what do I have here, declares the Lord? For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. All day long, my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore, my people will know my name. Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices together. They shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the articles of the Lord's house. But you will not leave in haste or go in flight, for the Lord will go before you. The God of Israel will be your rear guard. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. May the Lord add his blessing. <coughs> Our second reading this morning is from the second chapter of Luke, verses 8 through 20. Find on page 992 of the Red Pew Bible. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard this were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, 
glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as, had, as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Remember when you were that age? No, you don't. <laughs> Let's pray. What's that? Let's let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, we give you this time. Open uh, the eyes of our hearts. Uh, give us ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, folks, you know that I'm pretty much a news junkie. I stay informed, you know. And so this past week, I'm watching the news. And in the context of COVID lockdowns and the CDC officials encouraging people to forego the celebration of Christmas, right, with their loved ones, a news commentator said, and he was very disturbed at this suggestion, as I am, but he said, we should celebrate Christmas because Christmas is uniquely American. So I'm all for celebrating Christmas with loved ones and families and, and, and friends. Um, but I, I started to think, you know, Christmas is uniquely Christian. So I started to analyze that. I think what he actually meant uh, or was implying is that Christmas is widely celebrated and it's a, it, it, culturally it's the fabric of our society uh, around the holidays, right? I think that that's probably what he meant because it is not true that Christmas is uniquely American. Christmas is uniquely a message for all nations and all people, right? It's not uniquely American. It's about God's Savior and His message of salvation born in a manger. And the salvation message is offered, uh, whosoever will may come, for all nations and all people. That's the hope that was born at Christmas. Uh, the angelic pronouncement, uh, Savior has been born for you who is Christ the Lord. It was just not for the shepherds and not for the Jewish people. In fact, Isaiah's prophecy is that the Gentiles will, will see a great light as well. And so the multitude of angels that night sang a message of hope and peace that the Prince of Peace would offer. Now, I was thinking it's actually kind of easy uh, to see where the message of Christmas, if it's not clearly presented, uh, it can often be skewed or slightly twisted where it clouds people's understanding, right, of what the Christmas message is all about. So let me give you an example, because I think that this is generally true. For ever since the birth of Christ, there has been a longing and a desire of all nations that there would be peace on earth, right? I mean, in fact, putting Santa Claus aside, because he seems to somewhat have taken center stage in at least, you know, American Christmas culture, putting Santa Claus aside, uh, is not this the hope of the world? That there would be peace on earth? And that truth comes out of Isaiah's prophecy, right? Regarding the Christ child. Uh, he will be called the Prince of Peace and the government, the world government, will be upon his shoulders. You know, not the eight rich families in the world that seem to control everything, right? And so there's this earthly peace that has been longed for for a very, very long time. And, and we see uh, the hope uh, of this peace emerge actually during wartime. I'll give you a couple examples of this. Uh, this was uh, an account uh, from, from the Civil War published in Harper's Weekly in 1886 by a Reverend John Paxton. He actually was a veteran from the 140th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. Um, before I quote him, someone wrote, Paxton's account takes place on Christmas Day, 
Just after the Union failure at the Battle of Fredericksburg, while on patrol, Paxton and his comrades come upon a group of Confederate soldiers standing across the Rappaponic, I think I pronounced that right, Rappahannock River. Instead of fighting, the two sides showed signs of Christmas cheer. Paxton writes that the minister, quote, we had bridged the river, spanned the bloody chasm. We were brothers waving salutations of goodwill in the name of the babe of Bethlehem on Christmas Day in 62. At the very front of opposing armies, the Christ child struck a truce of us, broke down the wall of partition, became our peace. We exchanged gifts. We shouted greetings back and forth. We kept Christmas and our hearts were lighter of it and our shivering bodies were not so cold. That was amazing, right? See, the world divides. Christ brings together. Uh, this is not the only incident. You may be very familiar um, with the famous uh, Christmas truce in World War I in 1914. Uh, someone wrote, the sounds of rifles firing and shells exploding faded in a number of places along the Western Front during World War I in favor of holiday celebrations. During the unofficial ceasefire, soldiers on both sides of the conflict emerged from the trenches and shared gestures of goodwill. At the first light of dawn on Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across no man's land, calling out, Merry Christmas! in their enemies' native tongues. At first, the Allied soldiers feared that it was a trick, but seeing the Germans unarmed, they climbed out of their trenches and they shook hands with enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and sang carols and songs. Some Germans lit Christmas trees around their trenches and there was even a documented case of soldiers opposing from opposing sides playing a good-natured game of soccer. That's what Christ does, right? A German lieutenant, I'm not sure I'm going to get the name right, Kurt Zem Zemich recalled, quote, how marvelously wonderful and yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to, to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. So uh, we see this hope echoed on battlefields. We also see this hope on Christmas cards. If many Christmas cards annually have peace on earth. You see that phrase, peace on earth? I'll bet you you have one at home right now as I speak, right? And, as, and, and here's the point. As wonderful of a message peace on earth is, newsflash, this is not the Christmas message, is it? It's not. Scripture does not say, take a look at verse 14 of Luke 2. Scripture does not say peace on earth, but on earth peace. And ironically, if you notice, the rest of the message is left out. The most important part of the message is left out. Among men with whom he is pleased. Now, it's unfortunate that this part is, is glossed over. What we do is we skip over the spiritual blessings of peace with God and we go right to worldly peace. And we totally miss it. Uh, actually, peace among men with whom he is pleased can also be translated, you might have a translation that has this, of good pleasure or good will. And so... What's often conflated, you bring these two ideas together, what's often conflated is this. Uh, Isaiah's message about the Prince of Peace bringing peace someday and the message of Christ bringing peace between God and man. They're two separate truths. The Prince of Peace, when uh, Isaiah's prophecy was about a child, but he's not coming back as a child. When he comes back as the Prince of Peace, he will usher in peace after his second coming. 
But the angelic message was about how between now and then, He would bring peace among men with whom God is pleased. In other words, He would bring peace between God and man. Now, make no mistake about it, Christ will usher in a great peace someday. Uh, the message of the Prince of Peace is that the government will rest on His shoulders. Where human nations and governments have failed, Christ will succeed. Yes, it will be paradise on earth. Thorns and thistles will be removed. If you have a green thumb, you will not have to weed your garden. You won't have to pull out the thorns and the thistles. But peace on earth is not the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is, on earth, peace among men with whom He is well pleased. You know, under the Trump administration for the last four years, what have we seen? We have seen four nations cut a peace deal with Israel, right? Uh, you didn't hear much about it if you watch a liberal station like CNN because they didn't want to give Trump any ink or credit for that. But it's totally a fulfilling of prophecy as we know it. Um, but uh, people want peace. And yet, let us not remember what 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 says. While there's, they're saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So the message of the Prince of Peace is after the second coming of Christ. And so peace on earth is not the message of Christmas. It's the message of what God, how God will make every right, every wrong right someday. But the message of Christmas is that He would make us right before Him. That's the message of Christmas. Uh, we forget that God's going to burn everything up. He's going to destroy His enemies. And that includes sinful men who resist His reign and His rule. And that's the urgency of the Gospel message. Uh, Micah 4 verse 3 says of the Lord Jesus Christ, He shall judge between many peoples, and He shall decide disputes for strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. That will be a precious day, folks. But that's not the message of Christmas. Uh, one minister said, What a day that will be when all wars cease, when the peace of our Lord is fully realized, when Micah's prophecy comes to fruition. But for now, we are still in a world filled with threat, hostility, violence, and war. Therefore, it's worth asking, in what way does Christ bring peace? And how can we know that peace this Christmas? How can we know it? Uh, if you were with us last week, I touched on this piece. Remember I talked about the joy of Christ? And I talked about how actually peace with Christ uh, comes before joy with Christ. And uh, we looked at Romans chapter 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not about e eating and drinking, but about peace, about righteousness, peace and joy in that order. When you're righteous, when you're living right, you find the peace of God. And when you find the peace of God, the joy of Christ wells up into your soul, right? So it's a spiritual peace that we're talking about, not a literal peace on earth. And that's, that's the message of the angel that day. It's not an earthly peace depicted in, in you know, movies or which is desired on the battlefield. And that's the beauty of the message of Christmas. And it's a lasting peace that Christ has secured eternally when we enter into that. And, and this is so important because a lot of people, a lot of people, they run to church, but they don't really understand the gospel message relationally 
since Christ has come and died for our sin. They don't understand it relationally. And it's, and it's a personal relationship. You find that in churches that preach the gospel, we stress a personal relationship with Christ. Now, take a look at what the angel said. On earth, peace among men with whom He is pleased. You know what that implies? That implies that God is not pleased with men on earth. Do you ever stop and think about that? If you, if you invert this, God is not pleased with man. That's why Christ came to die. And you, most of you know the Scriptures, but I'm going to go through it again because it's so, so important. Uh, scripture teaches we're all born in Adam. We're all born in sin. We have a bent nature away from God. We are in Adam. We're under judgment. And we need a Savior. And Christ is our Savior. That's the message of the Gospel. And so we embrace Him relationally. We accept Him as our Savior. And we go from being a sinner to a saint. Now, we're still sinners, but we're in Christ. We're in the Beloved. We're, we are saints. You don't have to wait to be canonized. And that's so, so important. We go from a relationship of hostility in Adam to a one of peace in Christ. We go from an enemy relationship in Adam to one of friendship in Christ. Abraham was a friend of God because he believed God. And in the words of the German officer that I quoted a little while ago, thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends. He said for a time. But the Gospel is not for a time. It's not where God is my friend one day, and then He's not my friend the next. He's not my Savior one day, and then I'm unsaved the next. He is not my peace and my hope and my joy and my strength and my rock and my refuge one day, and the next day He's none of those. You know, God doesn't... He's not a chameleon. He doesn't change colors. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, why is it that when we believe we're pleasing in His sight? It's because we're in Christ. There's no condemnation. We're in the Beloved. God sees us in Christ. And that's why we are pleasing in His sight. And that's in Christ. Verse 14 is fulfilled because He sees us as pleasing. And, and that is ultimately why Christ came. That people would be pleasing in the sight of Almighty God because fallen man and Adam is not and under judgment. So, a Christmas peace has been secured. And, and, and what is this? It's not peace on earth. First and foremost, it's having peace with God. And think about the depths of this peace, folks. It reaches to the lowest hell, as the songwriter would say, and it reaches to the highest heaven. This is why the angel sang that night, glory to God in the highest. They were amazed at His great, great love that His mercy would reach down and that it would extend to the highest heaven. And what He does is He takes a child of hell, me and you, and He exhausts us and, and sits us in Christ into the highest heaven. Every spiritual blessing that you could have in all of eternity and all of the universe. Now, I want to talk about hell for a minute because hell's not a popular subject or topic uh, and it doesn't get much ink or traction these days, does it? Uh, we don't like to talk about it. You don't hear it from the pulpits that often. All we want to do is, you know what, you know what somebody says uh, to you, I've got good news and bad news. What do they say? Sometimes they say, well, give me the bad news first. Uh, we don't want to hear the bad news. Sometimes people just say, no, 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 don't give, just give me the good news. And see, that's what we want in our churches. We just want good news. We want to hear about heaven. We don't want to hear about hell. But we need to hear about hell. 
Because Scripture doesn't dismiss the topic. God reaches to the lowest hell and is willing to do that to save a person. And the Word of God expounds on this subject with human language uh, as best as you can imagine and muster. But let me give it to you. Uh, this is the short version. Eternal torment and suffering. Outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Fire and brimstone. Now, that's a horrible place. A terrifying place. And it's a real place. It's not something in the heart or the mind that's imagined. Because we understand that heaven is a literal place in a spiritual realm that we cannot see. We therefore understand that hell is also a literal place in the spiritual realm that we cannot see. And it was meant for the devil and his angels. And it breaks God's heart when people reject the gospel and they go to an eternal place that was made for the devil and his angels. And this is why Christ has come to save us from this horrid and wretched place. And, and I would submit to you that the picture of hell, the idea of it is so terrifying, horrific, it's so horrific, that if you and I were given a glimpse into what hell was like, we would be evangelists unceasingly. We would never shut our mouths. We would, we would open our mouths to everyone we saw. That's how horrific of a place it is. And I would also hope that every unbeliever, if they also had a glimpse of hell, that they would come and repent. Because they wouldn't want to go to that wretched place either. And this is what the angels... Think about this. The angels, when they sang that night, they know of the glory of God. They know of His holiness. They know of His wrath towards sinners. And yet they sang of His great, great mercy. His glorious mercy. They marveled that God would become man and die at the cross. They marveled at this message of hope and peace. God was offering it to Adam's race, not offering it to the fallen angels. And He makes all this possible through our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God in the highest. It's an amazing, amazing gospel and story. And so, and so Christ has secured an eternal place for you. And if you ever doubt in your salvation, then you're doubting in a God whom you believe in who has secured an eternal place for you. Now, let's talk about this being a positional piece uh, because I want to talk about an experiential piece. All right? Positional piece is we're in Christ. If you believe in Jesus, if you've asked Him to be your Savior and forgive you of your sin, you are in Christ. You're not under judgment. We'll call that a positional peace. The question is, have you asked Him to be your Lord and your Savior? Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you go to church because you think it's good and it's the right thing to do. Maybe it makes you feel good. But have you ever taken the time by your bedside, maybe in you know, um, the family room, the dining room, someplace, maybe on a mountainside, where you bow your head and you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. It's necessary to have this peace. Now, I also want to talk about an experiential peace. It's relational as well, but it differs from the positional piece in that it flows through the Spirit. And it's Spirit-filled and it's living and it's dynamic when we're in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, i got to tell you, when I was preparing this message, I had great peace. Great, great peace. There are times where I have had 
I have not had great peace. But having God's peace upon your heart is a wonderful thing. Uh, peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can find that reference in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But peace comes, and you know this, I think, peace comes when you walk with Christ, right? It's a peace that calms the heart and steadies the soul. It's a peace that settles the mind and the thoughts. It's a peace that brings contentment. You know, you're not running around and you're, you're content. It's a peace that passes all understanding. And it's a peace upon the heart despite hardship and heartache and heartbreak. Um, let me give you an example of what can come out of such peace amidst heartache and heartbreak. Uh, someone sent me a video this past week of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing uh, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is, is, does beautiful music. I mean, they've done it for years. Uh, but, let me warn you, um, the Mormons are not right in their theology. They do not preach the gospel of Christ. And, and they're identified as a cult because they twist the person and work of Christ uh, unto something other than, com than what comes out of the scriptures, okay? But they sing beautiful music, all right? But so I watched the 16 minute video segment, that beautifully done. The narrator talked about the person who had wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul, and gave details to the background. So I, um, I actually found a more concise um, quote from a Dr. Hahn, professor of sacred music at Perkins School Theology, Southern Methodist University. And this is the, this is the information about the background to It Is Well With My Soul. He says, um, or they say, quote, this, with this hymn comes one of the most heart-trending stories in the annals of hymnody, the author, author Horatio G. Spafford, and he lived from 1828 to 1888, was a Presbyterian layman from Chicago. He had established a very successful legal practice as a young businessman and was a devout Christian. Among his close friends were several evangelists, including the famous Dwight L. Moody, also from Chicago. Spafford's fortune evaporated in the wake of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Having invested heavily in real estate along Lake Michigan's shoreline, he lost everything overnight. In a saga reminiscent of Job, his son died a short time before his financial disaster. But the worst was yet to come. Hymnologist Kenneth Osbeck tells the story, quote, desiring a rest for his wife and four daughters as they were wishing to join and assist Moody and his musician Ira Sankey in one of their campaigns in Great, in Great Britain, Spafford Spandy planned a European trip for his family in 1873. In November of that year, due to an unexpected last minute business development, he remained in Chicago, but sent his wife and four daughters ahead, as scheduled on the SS Villa de Havre. I guess that's the ship. He expected to follow in a few days. On November 22nd, the ship was struck by the Lockern, an English vessel, and sank in 12 minutes. Several days later, Survivors were finally landed at Cardiff, Wales, and Mrs. Spafford cabled her husband, and she said, saved alone. The Mormon details, uh, Norman choir narrator gave details of how she was holding on to two kids. She, she got separated from two of the four. She was holding on to the two, and one slipped away, and then another slipped away. He lost four. They lost four children, four children in that horrific accident. 
Spayford immediately left to join his wife. Uh, this hymn is said to have been penned as he approached the area of the ocean thought to be where the ship carrying his daughters had sunk. And do you know what the first line of the hymn is? When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's the kind of peace Christ gives through heartache and heartbreak. I pray, I hope and pray, that none of us ever have to go through something like that, like Job did or like he did. But four children... In, in 12 minutes or less. Breaks your heart. And yet he loved God so much to pen that song. Uh, I was running around this past Friday um, trying to button things up with the Christmas gifts. And I was talking to a Christian woman. And she, she knew I was a pastor. And, and she shared how she lost her husband this past summer suddenly. And as I talked to her and I looked into her eyes, I could see the pain. And many of you people know that pain. And yet I also saw the peace. Because she's grounded. It's the peace of Christ that gets her through. And she emphatically said, I miss my husband, but I know he's in a far better place. I got peace about it. Only the Prince of Peace gives us this kind of peace. It reaches not only to the lowest hell and the highest heaven, but to the ends of the earth. In every circumstance, every event, every situation you and I might ever find ourselves in, the peace of Christ is there if we seek to find it. Now, I'm almost done. Just hang in there. I'm almost done. This peace doesn't come automatically, though, right? Doesn't come automatically. But it's experiential. It comes when we are still before Him. It comes when we're confident of His promises. And it comes, as the Apostle Paul says, when we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, Colossians 3.16. You know, I, in preparing this, I couldn't help but think of what Paul writes in Romans. Because... It's relational. And when you, when you own these scriptures relationally between you know, God, your Savior, and yourself, um, boy, it lays a great foundation for peace. But I'm going to read Romans 8, verses 37 through 39. You probably know it well. But in all these things, all, all circumstances, we, are more, we, we over, overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you know that nothing separates, there's a peace. Amen? And when we comprehend the depths of His love, then we can find the depths of his peace. If we're not sure about his love, we'll never find that peace. His peace is also found in deathbed situations. I, in my time, have watched many, many people die. It's a sobering time. It's not fun. And it's a very, very wicked thing. And if you've ever experienced that, you know that. It's heart-wrenching. And in the flesh, it brings fear and uncertainty and depression and hopelessness and discouragement. And yet with the mind of Christ and the Spirit, it brings peace and certainty and hope and exuberance and anticipation, knowing that we're with Him when that happens. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God 
who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus said, I go and I prepare a place for you. Psalms 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And so we can lay out, we can be on our deathbed, our head on our pillow, knowing that the end is near, and God can give us great, great peace and joy. All because of what he's done in Christ. In closing, uh, I think of some of the lyrics to uh, the Christmas carol, Ring the Bells. Let me read this. Uh, I love this song. You know, you, you, you start listening to song, songs, you just you want to sing them and hum them all week, right? Ring the bells, ring the bells, let the whole world know. Christ was born in Bethlehem many years ago, born to die, that man might live came to earth new life to give, born of Mary, born so low many years ago. God the Father gave His Son, gave His own beloved one to this wicked, sinful earth to bring mankind His love new birth. I wish I could sing it for you folks. They're not. Ring the bells, ring the bells. Let the whole world know Christ the Savior lives today as He did so long ago. So, the Christmas message is a message of a secured peace in Jesus Christ. It's not an earthly peace. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace with whom He is pleased. It starts relationally with getting right with God, accepting Him as your Lord and your Savior. It extends to the heart, the mind, and the soul. His peace does. His peace extends to all circumstances, to the lowest hell, to the highest heaven, to the ends of the earth. This is why we celebrate Christmas. The peace on earth, God will take care of that someday. But for now, this is why we exalt Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we, we read the account and we know that the angels marveled and they still marvel that you save sinful men and women from Adam's race. Uh, we bless you. Uh, we marvel at uh, you're just such an amazing God. You're a wonderful God. Uh, you're so, so humble and uh, so, so good to us. We, we bless you that we can be here this day to hear your word. We bless you for those of us who have peace with God, who are in the beloved. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would give us grace where we uh, experience um, uh, the peace of Christ as it rules and reigns in. We let him rule and reign in our hearts that we would, we would experience his peace and his joy and his love. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would take these truths, this message, these experiences um, to our homes, uh, to our places of work, that we might share the Christ of Christmas. I pray that you would bless each heart that's here. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.